Welcome to Inside Economics. I'm Mark Sandy, the Chief Economist of Moody's Analytics, and I'm joined by my two, I think it's now tradition for me to say, trusty co-hosts, two trusty co-hosts, uh, Chris Dorides and Marissa Di Natale. Hi, guys. Hi, Mark. Hi, it's Mark. good to see you yesterday. Oh, I know. We were in person. Yeah. Yeah, and it was a little sentimental, wasn't it? That Are you changing the, uh, your tune? You want to come back in the office? I'll have to tell you, I really enjoyed that in person. So we all... Uh, senior team met yesterday at our offices in person, kind of a strategic planning kind of session, which actually was highly productive. And I kind of missed, I forgot how that how good that was. That was really kind of cool. I could beat, beat up my brother, you know, he's sitting right next to me, like physically beat, beat him up, not just browbeat him, but, you know, push him and shove him. And did you see that? Did you catch that? I, I, I did. I did. Yeah. It's entertaining. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was a lot of, it was entertaining. Yeah, no. So, are, are you th you think we're making a mistake on virtual? We'll see. We'll see how we'll this see. all works it's out. It's going to be interesting to see how this all plays out. Yeah, of course, Marissa's always. You've been virtual for quite some time now, right? You from California? Eight years. Eight years. So you're used to this. You've you've adapted. Yeah. We're we're still adapting. You know, yeah, we're still adapt. So I testified in the House this week, uh, the House Budget Committee on the fiscal situation of the country. And the, the most interesting thing about it, what, a lot of interesting things, but the most interesting thing is it was four hours long, four hours long. Can you imagine that? So, you know, every congressperson gets, and the witnesses get five minutes, but there's a lot of Congress people. So, you know, it adds up to a lot of time. And I had forgotten that these last so long, and I would I did not ration my coffee intake, you know, before the hearing. <laughs> I, I tell you, my answers were getting shorter and shorter as we went along here. Yeah. Really long, really long. It was it was a it was an interesting uh, hearing. I, I, I will say the, though, yeah. oh no, yeah. go ahead, go ahead. What was the most uh, difficult question? Uh, that's a tough one. But I'll, I will say this: uh, I and this is just maybe the naive economist in me. I came away actually encouraged. Um, you know, I think there's yeah, believe it or not, there there is you know a clear sense that of urgency. Around the fiscal situation, and you know, both sides, Republican Democrat, coming at it from very, very different perspectives. But that's age old. That's always been the case. And I thought thought the conversation, the discussion, was actually very urbane and very policy oriented. I, I was I was a little nervous about it that it would be more politicized and people hitting each other over the head. But I didn't I didn't get that at all. So I I actually felt pretty good coming out of it. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of battles here dead ahead given the debt limit, but it all felt pretty good. But anyway, we got a guest, Charmaine. Hello, most of our Romani. <laughs> it's good to have you on uh, Inside Economics. Thank you for joining us. I'm certainly glad to be here with you. Yeah, it's it, and you know, Charmaine is uh, a, a big deal uh, at Goldman Sachs. She runs the investment strategy group, and you're the chief investment officer for the wealth management uh, function at uh, Goldman. And uh, here, here's the most significant thing, Charmaine. You're my cousin. You're my cousin. I know. What an honor for me. Oh, what an honor for me. <laughs> I, I I brag about you all. The, you should. You you don't know this, but I brag about you all the time. Every chance I get. Like, I was talking to some Goldman guys last night, and I go, "Oh, Charmaine's my cousin," and they go, "Oh, really? Charmaine's your cousin?" And immediately, my, the, you know, that my stature rises in their eyes. You know, so uh, it's really a, a, an honor to have you on the podcast, Charmaine. Can you just tell us a little bit about? how your journey to you know where you are today uh, how did how did uh, how did that happen what, what was your path to goldman sachs or to the industry yeah just generally i mean uh you know you have such a you know important position in a very uh, significant financial you know, probably the premier financial institution on the planet how did that happen you know is there just a little bit about your background it'd be interesting to hear uh, it's actually such an interesting question because whenever we're trying to recruit uh, young talent from undergraduate schools or from uh, graduate schools, they always ask about what has uh, been a factor, contributing factor to what makes people successful at Goldman and how did you plan your career? And I always tell them that my path was totally random, hmm. that it I ended up at Goldman Sachs completely by chance, and I ended up in the financial industry by chance. When I graduated from uh, grad school, I was more interested in energy 
and energy prices were tanking and nobody had any interest in hiring anybody in the energy sector, whether it was in the financial sector, whether it was in consulting, and nobody was expanding that practice. It was all shrinking. So I literally uh, took forever to find a job. And since my uh, work had been a little bit in quantitative economics, as a graduate stu student out at California, they were looking for somebody with some basic ca optimization capabilities. Hmm. And so I ended up in finance completely by chance because a small research firm was looking for someone. And so that one thing led to another. And then when I wanted to move to New York, I was looking at a couple of different firms. And actually one option, funnily enough, was Credit Suisse First Boston at the time mm. and versus Goldman Sachs. And one of our friends said, are you crazy? You must do Goldman Sachs. How could you think about Credit Suisse First Boston? And of course, 30 years later, they had incredible foresight of... Yeah, they got that right. They got <laughs> it's that unbelievable. Right. Yeah. 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 And he actually, actually happens to be an economist and had his own economics consulting firm and very, very uh, thoughtful and writes interesting columns. And so it was great Who's advice. That? Can I ask who? Can I ask who that? It's uh, Erwin Stelzer. Oh, yeah. I don't know the name. Yeah. He's much older now much and older. retired oh, okay. and okay. Uh, still writes something for a couple of uh, papers and has had his own firm and sold it oh, years cool. and years ago. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. Um, and so you've been with Goldman now for, well, well, maybe I shouldn't ask. Is that okay if I ask? I mean, <laughs> probably as long as I've been- Alive, you mean. Probably yeah. as long as you've been alive. <laughs> okay. <laughs> feels sure, that way. Sure. Sure. Yeah, yeah. You, you. Yeah. It sure feels that well. I, I, I will say- 30 years. 30 years, yep. yep. Um, and um, I will say I-, I uh, I get to read your work all the time and uh, I'm a careful consumer of it. And I think it's absolutely fabulous, you know, work that you guys do. And, and you got a great team there. I mean, Goldman is pretty deep, got a lot of really great economists uh, throughout the, the, the company. And I, of course, I read a lot of research uh, and the only research I will read literally every day is the Goldman research. I mean, it's that good. It is really, really good. So um, you, you've done a fabulous job. Um, okay. So there's a lot to talk about. Uh, you, I know, uh, you have done some recent work on the, uh, Chinese economy and its prospects. And I, I, we will come back to that because that's a great deal of interest. Probably after we play the statistics game, we're going to play the statistics game sometime, you know, down the road here, but first and foremost, uh, top of mind is the, the, the ongoing banking situation, although it feels a little less threatening today than it did a week ago or two weeks ago. Maybe I can ask uh, uh, to start the conversation. Uh, do you think the crisis is over? Do you, you know, do you think we're this is winding down or how are you thinking about that? One of the key attributes of our research and what we do is to have confidence where we have some certainty and to convey uh, the uncertainty. So in fact, the cover of our outlook this year, we called it caution heavy fog. And the message was there's a lot of uncertainty. So when it comes to this sort of mini banking crisis, we would say there's still some uncertainty. We don't really know and have transparency into the balance sheets and the deposit outflows of small and um, medium-sized regional banks or some of the larger regional banks. But we do know that the regulators have a lot of insight. And if they're being more patient in terms of any liquidity measures, anything else that they're doing, or forcing, for example, thinking about what happens to First Republic, giving them time, then they must be seeing a little bit of a calmer environment. And so we assign a higher probability that the worst is probably over. And clearly the equity market is pricing it that way as well. Yeah. Okay, Chris, is that your kind of sense of things? Do you think the worst is over as well? Well, I'm hopeful that's hopeful. the case. But uh, yeah. you know, Charmaine, things... you should know Chris is the the bear among us. So, you know, just, just to get that straight. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. I mean, these uh, these crises never are one and done, right? They typically have ups and downs as you're going through them. So it's possible that the worst is over. And yeah, there could be some future failures, but we can handle them. Or there might be another shoot a drop. So um, I think we need to, I think we need to continue to be, remain cautious here. And Marissa, any perspective on that? Yeah, I'm, yeah. I I agree. I mean, it seems like the worst is over. Um, it seems like it was relatively contained, but we've been surprised before. Yeah. I mean, 
given the policy response, you know, given how muscular that has been, where the Treasury, Fed, uh, FDIC have come in and said, hey, for depositors and failing institutions, they're basically at this point now saying the, those depositors, small, big, doesn't matter on the deposit insurance limit, they're guaranteed. Yeah. And then the bank term funding facility that the Fed established to provide liquidity to the bank so that they can uh, borrow against their security holdings at par and then use that cash to meet their funding needs, including paying depositors. It 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 feels like the worst has got to be behind us, right? I mean, it's hard to construct, in my mind, to construct a scenario where things go off the rails again. Or am I missing something? And what do you think, Sherman? Mark, there was a very interesting session yesterday at the Bentheim Center at Princeton, and Bill mm -hmm. Dudley was the guest speaker. And the, uh, the host, uh, the director of the Bentheim Center, asked that exact same question. And the they did a little survey, and they asked the audience, what were the, the what was this mini crisis most like? And they made comparisons to the SNL crisis, global financial crisis, going to the 80s. And the re reality is that while we do believe history is a very useful guide, on the other hand, there have been significant changes since the global financial crisis. And time and time again, the Fed, uh, the regulators have been very responsive, quick attack, just like we saw during the pandemic. And so to your point, if you go through the measures taken and the fact that they're being very patient with First Republic and are not panicking and are not doing anything dramatic there tells us that they think the worst is over. And obviously, one could look at the glasses half empty, half full. And I think, Mark, the point that you raise about your colleagues, I think everybody should have a little plaque when they start speaking, glass half full or glass <laughs> half empty kind of person, because then your audience and our clients can put yeah, their comments into, into context, because some people just have different perspectives. But our view is, again, one should never say it's 100% certain, but we would say more more likely than not, whether it's 60 or 70% that the worst is over. Right. Okay. So that that's an interesting observation. So I, I think I would have, the plaque would say glass half. What would you guys say? Say, oh. I'd say uh, your glass is three quarters full. <laughs> three quarters full. <laughs> From your perspective. All the time. And Marissa, what would, Marissa's different, uh, Charmaine. I'm not sure. I, I can't peg her. Uh, what would you say? I think I'm a glass half full kind of person. Kind of person. Yeah. Okay. And, and Charmaine, are you glass half full or glass half empty? Three quarters full. <laughs> three quarters Maybe. full. Oh. Three quarters full. Okay. But that's all right. Family. We live longer. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah. More optimistic people live longer. Well, it, and also that works, right? In the context of American history, for sure, right? I mean, you can't, uh, what's the old, is it the Buffett? Uh, Warren Buffett said, don't bet against the American economy because you'll lose. I mean, you know, ultimately. So it, it, I think it, it, it benefits to be glass half uh, full as opposed to half empty, but uh, that's just my perspective. Just my perspective. Uh, well, Mark, in fact, in here too, right? Mark, in fact, uh, you raise a point about Warren Buffett's observation. We have had a view of U.S. preeminence uh, first since the inception of our group in 2001. But in fact, even when it comes to uh, investment recommendations, we have a larger strategic asset allocation to U.S. equities. Mm. And we reiterated that view since the global financial crisis, when everybody was saying, oh, did this financial crisis deal a fatal blow to the U.S. economy? And so that actually has implications, not just for the equity allocation, but the second theme of staying invested, you're better off betting that earnings per share growth in the U.S. is very solid mm -hmm. in the long run, and you want to be invested in U.S. equities. So, in fact, it does have significant implications when you're thinking about the U.S. Yeah. So, so what you're saying is that you know all uh, you 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 have your view of the market can change up or down, but on average, you should be more positive about the prospects for the market because on average. U.S. economy will outperform and do well, uh, and uh, that would support equity prices. That's kind of the perspective. Did yes, if you there? think exactly, if you think yeah. about uh, GDP growth, yeah. more often the U.S. economy is growing than in recession, yeah. right. and so uh, that er growth generates earnings per share growth, and the S and P five hundred will, on average, follow that earnings growth, they might diverge short term, but eventually they converge. They and converge. so the bias should be 
to be fully invested and not underweight U.S. equities. Yeah, see, Chris being the half uh, glass or empty kind of guy, that's why he's so invested in crypto. Uh, you know, he's just, he's he's like <laughs> deep into crypto, deep into crypto. Uh, but anyway, um, so the the fallout. So let's let's go in of the of the crisis. Let's go with uh, the high the most likely scenario with a reasonably high probability is that the worst is over. You know, maybe there'll be another failure or two or three, probably if they are small institutions and uh, uh, it won't uh, be systemic in any way, that the system is kind of nailed down given the policy response. If that's the case, do you expect a significant or meaningful fallout of the crisis on economic growth and activity? Is that uh, is this going to be a, a headwind to economic growth? At the margin, one could say lending standards have tightened, credit availability has been reduced, whether it's in the public markets with widening credit spreads or from bank lending. So at the margin, it will have some impact. The question is, what will that impact be? And there's a range out there. Some people at two tenths, three tenths, one of the external um, economic research firms we look at has seven tenths, which we think is way too high. Mm -hmm. But let's say take the midpoint of these numbers. Uh, a third to a quarter of a percent, low, let's say 0.3.4 percent lower. So mm -hmm. a quarter is at the low end. But then on the on the other hand, if you think about it, since that last Friday, so if you look at data since Thursday, financial conditions as measured by the S and P, as measured by interest rates, as measured in fact by the dollar have all eased a little bit. So the dollar is a little bit cheaper, the S&P is a little bit higher, in 10-year rates are a little bit lower. People are more and more convinced that we're nearing the end of the Fed tightening cycle. So that's going to be also a stabilization. And overall, you look at the returns in the equity market and the bond market, and they've been pretty attractive. So when you look at that in its entirety, growth will be a little bit slower than if we hadn't had the uh, Silicon Valley and Signature Bank episodes, but we think that'll go by and it'll be a little bit slower. And there's enough uncertainty around the growth number and the recession probabilities that'll be so hard to discern that two tenths, three tenths, four tenths. Like it's sort of a little bit of false precision when we actually are not exactly sure what are the odds of a recession, how quickly will inflation come down. So our view is that it'll be something but hard to know exactly what. Yeah, uh, of course, that's kind of our perspective, right? I mean, uh, what are we? We're estimating down three, four tenths of a percent. G. This is a, a year over year GD, real GDP growth, Q four of twenty twenty two through the Q four of twenty twenty three. That that these events that have un, uh, unfolded here in the banking system will shave at three or four tenths of a percent of growth. And so instead of growing, I don't know, make up the number a little bit, one and a half percent, we're going to grow. 1.1%, something like that. Is that right, Chris? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Our forecast was, I think it was 1.5, and now it's 1.3%. Uh, right, right. One thing I, I have noticed that makes me feel even more confident that the fallout isn't going to be as great is the decline in mortgage rates. Have you noticed that? I mean, the 30-year fixed rate mortgage was... I think it was over 7% before this mess. And now we're, feels like we're closer to six. Is that right? I think that's right. Yeah. Well, we, I thought we were still around six and a half. But. Well, I'm looking at the, 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 the uh, mortgage so daily, numbers. you know, the, oh, okay. the, yeah, the daily numbers. And I, they're, they've been hovering around 6% in the last few days, last couple of days. So that would, that would go a long way to ameliorating some of the fallout from the, Although, yeah, I agree. Although I think we have to be careful with when we look at any of these rates in terms of uh, the availability, right? The rate might no, be a good low, point, right? But in the tightening, maybe through the qualifications, right? So you just have fewer people able to get uh, a loan, right? And you have the credit tightening through that avenue, even though the che it's uh, the cheaper, perhaps, for those who actually do qualify. Yeah, good point. Good point. Hey, Charmaine, so monetary policy. So what do you think this means? for the Federal Reserve and future rate increases. Um, I, I don't know, I haven't, I, I can't quite remember. What do you, do you have a perspective on how many more rate hikes are dead ahead or any rate hikes dead ahead? We started the year with a target of five to five and a quarter. 
And we haven't changed that. I know some people opted when we came into 2023 with stronger economic momentum. And then people changed their views because of this. And now they're back up again. We're actually staying at, to, at five to five and a quarter. They will definitely pause a little bit, see if the inflation trend downwards will continue. Again, we, re, we all recognize the goods component and we understand the housing component, but are we going to see it enough in wages as well? And so our view is they'll do that and pause for just a little while, knowing that there's still a little bit left in uh, the impact of the big uh, rate hikes that we've seen. Obviously, most of the impact of this big increase in rates, we've already felt most of it, let's say towards the end of 2022, the last two quarters, but there's still some lingering impacts. And so they need to wait a little bit. Yeah. So right now the funds rate target, the key rate, the Fed controls is just under five. So it's four and three quarters to five. And you're saying we're going to get one more rate hike here, a quarter yes. point at some point in the next meeting or so. And then that's the so-called terminal rate. That's the highest the rate's going to get in this cycle. Well, our view is that they're actually going to be data-driven. So they'll get their pause and Play then pause. they'll look at the data for a couple of <laughs> months and then wait. In the report, we actually quote uh, Chairman Powell, where he says, it's not noble if we're going to have a recession. They need to be data-driven and watch mm -hmm. for incoming data. And we think that's very important. If the chairman who actually runs the FOMC and controls some of the dialogue says it's unknowable and we need to wait and see it and be data driven. Um, our view is they're going to do one more hike and then be data driven. Yeah. And then given your outlook for the economy, would that suggest that they that they'll need to raise rates more at some point down the road? Or is that the end of it? Or do you think the markets seem to be thinking we're going to be cutting rates here pretty soon. Uh, uh, is that uh, where, where do you have a sense of that given the, the context of your your outlook for the economy? We don't expect uh, rate cuts. We actually have a reasonably positive view of U.S. equities. Our target for the S and P 500 is between uh, 4,200 and 4,300. So from current levels, that's up another nine percent, and for the whole year, that's up about 13 percent with dividends. So in the low low teens. And between that and what people are earning on their cash, the deposits and money market funds, and what they're earning in the bond market, we think that's actually a pretty positive environment. And it's unlikely that the Fed will actually be cutting rates that quickly, unless, again, something else were to happen, anything geopolitical, other factors. Sure. So so the S&P 500 is at a little over 4,000 right now. Yes. And you're saying by the end of the year, your expectation is 4,200 to 4,300, somewhere in yes. that range. I, yeah, I see, that's our base case. Right. And we assign a 50% probability to that. But then we also assign a pretty good 20% to actually the numbers being even higher. And so that's why we would encourage people to stay invested, ride this volatility. We tell our clients the most important thing they should do is think about their long-term strategic asset allocation. What's the right amount of equities? What's the right amount of bonds? Depending on their the size of their portfolio, could they do alternatives like private equity? But just so you know, we definitely do not recommend uh, cryptocurrencies. No crypto in there. Uh, no I, crypto. I, no crypto. <clears throat> so are you a crypto investor? I can't. I am not. No. You are not. Yeah, you didn't <laughs> strike me as a crypto investor. I'm a pretty risk averse person. What are you following Charmin's advice about being fully invested in I equity? I mean. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, you are. I have okay. a long time till retirement. I can ride. I out. know you do. You yeah. Do. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Plenty of time. Um, so that that sounds pretty glass half full. You know, forty two hundred, forty three hundred by the end of the year. Uh, that suggests no recession. You know, deadhead. If we're going to have a recession, you would expect the equity market to fall. So here, but here's a question before you explore that a little bit more in detail. That's confused me. Uh, I, you know, I like most economists, I look at financial indicators along with a lot of other indicators, but financial indicators as a kind of a barometer of where the economy is headed. Because, of course, investors are forward looking and they're trying to incorporate into their investment decisions what they think the economy is going to be doing down the road, you know, growth, inflation, everything else. So you look at the equity market, the 4,000 on the SP. And by the way, I think people don't recognize this, that that is roughly been 4,000 for almost a year, right? I mean, it's up and down all around, but, you know, pretty much uh, almost a year, it's been around 4,000. 4, so it's basically been flat. 
So that doesn't seem to, and of course your forecast is for it to increase a little bit here through the end of the year. That doesn't suggest recession. That that would be a lie recession. But then I look into the bond market and I look at the shape of the yield curve, you know, the difference between long-term interest rates and short-term rates and, you know, 10-year yields are, you know, 3, 3.5%, the two-year treasury yields at 4.2%, the three-month treasury bill is at 4.7%. That's pretty inverted. And, in, and historically, when you have that kind of inversion, that would suggest infl uh, a recession dead ahead, you know, 12 months down the road. Does that, <clears throat> have you thought about that? Does that confuse you too? Or do you have some, how do you square that circle in your mind? So if you think about the equity market last year, right, we had a pretty significant high to low drop. You're talking about 25% roughly. And if you look at the average or the median of the equity market in past recessions, that number is factoring in a high likelihood of a recession. So one could actually argue that the equity market already priced in a recession. Mm, I see. Not to your yield curve point, we actually have what we call our yield curve diffusion index. It's a series of yield curve inversions over different time periods. And whenever that index has hit 100, we have had a recession, except for the mid 1960s. So it has a very good success rate in terms mm. of anticipating a recession. But the interesting thing about this yield curve diffusion index is that, as you point out, when you see these inversions, typically you start seeing a recession a year forward. This yield curve inversion does show an average of 13 months, but it's actually a very bimodal distribution, meaning either you get the recession very quickly when this diffusion index triggers, and it triggered last summer, usually uh, within a couple of quarters. So the, the, the minimum is five months. So typically you'd say a couple of quarters pass. And so in theory, one would have been in a recession now if you end up with the first part of the distribution or it's actually two years out. Hmm. So we're talking 2024. Hmm. So our view is given that we didn't and are unlikely to have a recession in these first couple of quarters and looking at your numbers, you're not expecting that either, then one would say, okay, it could be something that happens in 2024. And so rather than say we're definitely going to have it in 2024, again, we ju we'll just look at the data and decide on 2024 later. If it looks like it's likely, then obviously the market will trade off later in towards this year. Now, people will say, well, because of everything going on in the economy, are we going to have a decrease in earnings? And certainly e earnings expectations have been trending downwards, earnings forecasts have actually come down around uh, 10, 11%. So again, without a recession around the corner, the market has already adjusted somewhat even, somewhat even on the earnings side. And so our view is that it's possible that the market's already priced a fair amount of negative news. Hmm. And unless a recession is imminent, then that allows for some upside, but maybe there's a recession to be seen in 2024, but we can decide on that later. Oh, interesting. Can can I ask, because I am an economist and I like to go into the weeds a little bit. I had not heard about the, I've not seen or read about your uh, yield curve diffusion index. Can, can you explain that in a little bit more detail? What is that exactly? Or if there's, if it's, I'm not taking anything proprietary. So I'll definitely send it to you, but okay. it's a series of indexes over weekly, uh, monthly, three-month data, and it's a series of different points on the curve. So I'll definitely send it to you. Okay. Okay. Very good. So so what you're saying is we dodged a bullet, a near-term bullet. I mean, if you look at the, the, the decline in the equity market back in early 2021, you look at your diffusion, your yield curve diffusion index, it would, those two things would have suggested maybe a recession is imminent. That has not happened. 2022. 2022. Yes. So that's not happened. But uh, based on these re historical relationships, there's another bullet coming in 2024. And that so potentially we could have a recession in 24. It's not a, it's not out, outside the realm of, you know, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a scenario with a reasonable probability that we. Could. Yes. Yeah, I see. Yes. OK. OK, very good. So uh, let me ask. Uh, I'm going to ask Chris and then Marissa, going back to my question to Charmaine about squaring the equity market with the yield curve, how, how do you square those two things? Oh, I'll throw one more thing into the mix uh, just to make it even more complex. 
if you look at corporate bond spreads, you know, they've risen a little bit. That's the difference between the yield on, on uh, corporate bonds and risk-free treasuries. And that, that difference, that spread reflects investors' uh, um, concerns or not about credit risk, that, they not, that the, the business isn't going to be able to pay back on the bond in a timely way. And so when that spread widens, that, that's investors saying, hey, I think these businesses are going to have problems selling whatever they produce, profits are going to come under pressure, cash flow, and I'm going to may not get my money on time. Those spreads have been, they, they've again, they've widened a little bit in the banking situation uh, uh, crisis, but they are remain very narrow, thin by broad historical standards. So you got those three data points coming out of the financial system. How do you, how, Chris, how do you square those things? Well, high yield spreads have gapped out, right? No, they're still, but yes, but they're still very low by historical standards. Okay, yeah, they're not screaming yeah. recession, but they they're, are no. elevated, right? Are, are, well, that's a fact. Chris is definitely a glass all empty kind yes. of person. <laughs> there you I go. <laughs> just uh, just spread. keeping it real. Just keeping it's, it. Real. It it has widened, but it is definitely not uh, so wide that you would think it's really attractive and worthy of getting invested in high yield. We monitor these markets, and you would say yes, it's widened, but not that much to make it a particularly attractive oper investment opportunity. So I just think it's good to put some parameters around, oh yes, it's widened. I, I am so happy Charmaine is on my side. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, on my side. So, but Chris, I, how do you square that 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 seeming circle uh, in, in your mind? Because Chris does think there's a very high probability of recession, you know, here in the next 12 to 18 months. Yes, although I would agree further out, right? So 24, 2020, end of 2023, early 2024, not in the immediate quarter or two, right? You still have a lot of strength here. So how do I square this? Oh, I, I think the bond market's right and the equity market's wrong. Right? So, the, so, so does that mean the equity market's going to go down again? It's gonna, What's that? See, equity, you think if we're going to have a recession, do we get another leg down in equity prices? And then we just haven't gotten there yet. Yes, there's a lot of volatility, as you, as you mentioned. Um, earnings may be marked down, but then... As you said, the stock market hasn't really moved, so that you have some uh, PE expansion that that's going on there. So uh, obviously, people are making different bets here, and they're they're, they're betting that uh, we squeak through. But the equity market we know is, is can be quite volatile; is not a great predictor of recession. Yeah. So I would tend to follow more the uh, the bond market, and there the the signal does seem much more pessimistic in terms of the, the probabilities. The yield curve. The yield curve. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Uh, Marissa, any any do you have a view on this? How, how um, you... No offense, Charmaine, but I I kind of ignore the equity market when it comes to recession and and any sign about the actual economy. I mean, we've seen there they can be very divorced, right? Historically, just what's going on in the real economy and what's going on in equity markets. So, yes, it's it's maybe telling us something, particularly in certain segments of it, but I would agree. I would tend to look more at the bond market and other real economic indicators. I'll say, I, you know, we always talk about our probabilities of recession in, on this podcast. And um, I think I'm still around 50, but with a bias to the upside, maybe closer to 55%, but that's, over the next 12 months, I don't see a recession this year, but I do agree that there's probably an elevated risk of recession in 2024. I think that if we see a recession in the next couple of years, it'll be next year. Those it's interesting. You, you, you say that you uh, don't really uh, think the stock market has any uh, sort of predictive or any significant uh, predictive power in terms of what might be happening. But again, think about it. The financial conditions tightened way ahead of the Fed raising rates and the bond market following, and the equity market actually led that. So the equity market was actually, in this particular example that we're talking about, a leading indicator in terms of the slowdown in the economy and the risks of inflation and the Fed having to tighten. So I I, th I think um, it is true that uh, lots of times the equity market has predicted a recession and it hasn't happened. That's true of bonds, that's true of credit spreads. But on the other hand, you would say we already had this huge, huge downdraft. And so that already indicated 
something significant. And it's not as if we're well above the levels at the beginning of last year. So I think that's one thing to think about. The other thing is that if we, for example, do not have a recession this year, the biggest impact of the Fed tightening would have abated. So the question becomes, what will actually trigger a recession further down? And if you have enough earnings, and we're not thinking earnings are going to be double digit, we have modest mid single digit earnings growth, the market has maybe low single digit earnings growth. But if you actually have an economy growing, and you have global growth at two to 3%, then your S&P 500 companies will generate reasonable earnings. And then in that case, what will actually trigger a recession in 2024? So again, even though our yield curve diffusion index indicates that, one could say if one can get out of this and you do see wages coming down slowly, then what would trigger a recession in 2024? I think that's why we don't say it's highly likely. It so happens the range we have in our reports and we stuck to that is 45 to 55%. For all your listeners, Mark, if they would like to look at the report, it's actually on Goldman's website and you're quoted in there. There's your number that you had at the yeah. beginning of the year. We have it in there. So for anybody who'd like to look at it and see our rationale. And I think I'm right in the middle of your range at 50%. You're, you're exactly. 45, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and I would point out, going back to the equity market as a predictor of recession, it is very much the case that, and it's the old, Economists quip the stock market has predicted nine of the last five recessions for sure, but I don't think there's ever been a recession where the equity market hasn't headed south. You know, before the recession, because investors say earnings are are, are going to fall, and I'm I'm out of here, and start, take stock prices with it, and then it becomes, as you point out, Charmaine, there's some cause, causal relationship there because financial conditions tighten, and it you know contributes to the weakening in the economy, so. Uh, but w uh, one last thing about the equity market before we move on, here's the way I kind of think about what's happened in the equity market over the last 12 to 18 months. That that large decline at the beginning of 2021, that 25% peak to trough decline, that felt more like PE price earnings multiple compression related to the increase in interest rates or the expectation that interest rates were going to increase. It wasn't really about uh, investors thinking uh, earnings were going to decline. And so that 25% is basically taking the price earnings multiple back to something that's more reasonable given where interest rates are going to be, you know, here going forward. And the stability, the relative stability in the equity market at this point reflects now the expectation, well, the worst of the rate hikes are over, you know, we're pretty close to the peak on the 10 year treasury yield. And I'm still expecting earnings growth to be positive, not negative. Therefore, that's consistent with, uh, you know, the uh, flat equity market, and also consistent with no recession. That that, that equity markets are not not anticipating recession. Does that does that make sense? The way I just articulated that. We've had a big debate internally, uh, not just among our own colleagues in the investment strategy group, but also with David Costin, who's our chief U.S. equity strategist at Goldman Sachs, in the global investment research team, and he would attribute the decline to the rise in interest rates and the expectation of increases because the equity market did decline ahead of the full increase in rates. And we actually say it was a combination and we have to attribute the decline to both factors because if you look at the amount of focus on recession mm -hmm. and how much people were talking about recessions to say that everybody was focused on it and talking about it, but it had no impact on the equity market, to us seems a little bit like a stretch. Yeah. And in terms of the interesting point about the Fed uh, tightening and what that means for recession versus the question about the equity market predicting recessions, we've had a lot of Fed tightening cycles, not all of which have led to recessions. Mm -hmm. So that's also an important factor to consider. Obviously, we've never had quite this speed and magnitude since the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, but our view is it's not a given that we're definitely going to have a, a recession. Yep. And okay. and you know, our colleagues, Global Investment Research, they have a 35% probability of recession. Uh, and then at the other end of the spectrum, our former colleague and former head of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, Bill Dudley's at 60. Yeah. Right. So here yeah. are incredibly thoughtful people at the opposite ends of the spectrum. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, Jan Hatzius is your colleague and the other side, and he's at 35%. <laughs> and I was fortunate to be, be on a panel enough to be on a panel with him. And very, very convincing. The same panel, though, had Larry Summers, and 
he takes a very different perspective. So it was a very interesting panel, you know, a very, very interesting panel. Uh, I can't wait to figure out who's right or who's wrong uh, on that one. Uh, if you think about people who were predicting a recession last year, yeah, and that didn't materialize, yeah. So the some of the loudest voices on saying that we would have a recession last year, yeah. And you remember you did all that great work on the spread between GDP and GDI and whether oh, what right. we're experiencing the first two quarters was a recession or not. Yeah. So some of those voices were all saying a recession last year, and now they've just moved it forward. Yeah, that, that's the other problem with predicting recessions that I've always had a tr problem with. I mean, yeah, we're going to have a recession at some point, but and if you're saying there's a recession, you got to pick the date, don't you? And don't you have to tell me exactly why the recession occurred because that affects everything else your, you know, all your other expectations and forecasts. And and that's a that's people have a hard time doing. How do you do that? That's like, you know, incredibly difficult to do. But anyway, hey, let's uh, we're going to go back to China, but I want to play the statistics game uh, and I think Charmaine's going to stay be, be an observer here, so uh, and uh, adjudicate any disagreements <laughs> that uh, materialize. Uh, so, uh, for the listener, the uh, statistics game is: we each put out a statistic. The rest of the group tries to figure that out through questions and deductive reasoning and uh, clues. The best uh, statistic is one where it's not so easy that we get it immediately. <clears throat> uh, that's pretty hard to do when I'm playing the game. I, I admit, uh, but but nonetheless, and then. Uh, not too hard. Uh, I, I know I shouldn't show more humility. Uh, hard for me to do, but I'll I'll try. Uh, you got to show me. You got to show me up in this game today, and 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 not so hard that we'll we'll never get it. Okay. Tradition is that uh, Marissa, you go first. So fire away. Okay. You already stole my original statistic. I know. I'm sorry in the, about that. In the preamble leading the up preamble. to the podcast, so I had to scramble for another. Well, one. by the way, mention that statistic though, because it's an important one. Yeah, I was I was going to use uh, 3.6 percent, which is the one year ahead inflation expectation out of the University of Michigan survey that came out this morning. So that is the lowest consumer inflation expectation we've had since April of 2021. Yeah, pretty good. And it's been on a, a pretty good downward trajectory and it's down from almost five and a half percent, which is where it peaked in the middle of the summer of 2022. So good news, not too far off from what our, in, you know, where we think year ago inflation will be at the end of this year. We think it'll be just north of 3%. So encouraging that consumers are expecting lower prices and that seems to be getting better. Um, you know, month after month. Yeah. Do you have a backup statistic? I do. Okay. Fire away. Okay. So my backup statistic is 83.2. 83.2. Is it, is it a survey-based measure? Is that from a survey? Yeah. Oh, oh. boy. Oh, so that pause. That's yeah. a, like a scary pause. What does that mean? <laughs> Either it is or it's, oh, is it a government statistic? No. Okay, it's a oh. from a private. It's a, a mm -hmm. private survey. Is it not? Is it from the University of Michigan? No, it, no, no. Okay. Conference board. Nope. No. Um. Okay. It came out this week. It did. Yep. Okay. Is it related to manufacturing activity? No. Um. Uh. Jesus, region, regional Fed survey? No, no, no. Uh, small business, the SFIB survey, the small business. That was last yep. week. It wasn't yeah. this week. Uh, are we barking up the wrong tree? Is it? Is you it are barking up the wrong tree. Oh, okay. It feels oh. like we are. Is it a growth rate? No. Okay. It's a ratio of something to something. No. Oh That's my gosh. Number. Should we know this number? Yes. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Particularly, Chris should know this number. Chris, oh, is it housing oh, related? It is housing related. Oh, is it from the? Um, I know it's the uh, the pending home sales number. It yeah. is the National yeah. Association of Realtors pending home sales, right? Okay, so yeah. uh, that's embarrassing, Chris. I'll have to say that's embarrassing I'm for both of us, actually. Number. That which it, number was it from there? It's not. Oh, oh no, he it's knows the, the numbers. Overall, in it, it's the overall index. Oh, it is. Okay. Yeah. Right. It's oh, the oh, overall oh, index the for the month of number. February. Oh, yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I picked it because it is the 
So this is measuring the number of pending home sales during the month from the, the NAR. And it's the highest that it's been since August. And this is the third consecutive month in which it's risen. So suggesting that, again, perhaps the housing market has found a bottom, things are looking up, mortgage rates, as we just talked about, are a little lower than they were a month ago. So um, there might be some renewed activity in the housing market, which bodes well for the outlook as well. Yeah, that makes sense. 6% mortgage right. rate, that should help too. Chris, how embarrassing is that? Uh, I, you know, I look at the percentage changes, your uh, blah, 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 blah. Index value. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a good one though. That's a good one. Yeah. Hey, Charmaine, do you think, do you guys, do you have a view on housing and, uh, and uh, house prices in particular? Is that something that you guys focus on at all as an, uh, yes, we do on a household formation, which has been pretty remarkable for the yeah. last, uh, couple of quarters, right? If you look at some of the data on household formation, it's quite quite remarkable. You're talking numbers well over 2 million relative to, let's say, a run rate before the pandemic at around one, one and a quarter million. So uh, yes, we do. And we look at affordability and we think the fact that uh, Case Schiller home prices have come down is a positive several yeah. months in a row. So do you think uh, further price declines or are we close to the end of the uh, price declines? Do you have perspective? What's very interesting in the data uh, is that it is so dispersed. So we look at all these averages, but the reality of it is prices are coming down much more in the West Coast than in the East Coast. And then you have some of these states which are doing much better. And the population moves and immigration all are affecting the different markets. So I think generally there's going to be less upward pressure, more downward pressure. But also I think it'll be definitely varying by the, the spread among regions will be great as it has been the last, I don't know, let's say a few quarters. Yeah, 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 yeah. We put uh, we do these repeat sales indices where we track actual transaction and create indices. And just to your point, national house prices are down and how about I'm not taking your statistic, Chris, down 2% from the peak back last summer. But in San Francisco, the Bay Area, it's down 10 to 15, depending on where in the Bay Area you're looking. I mean, it gives you a real sense of it. And uh, and actually in the pending home sales report, if you look at it by region, the West yeah. was the only region where pending home sales fell. Oh, is they that right? In every other region, yeah. Okay, that would be consistent. Interesting. Hey, Chris, what's your statistic? Uh, I was going to go with housing, but I'll go 42 oh. point. 42.2. 42. Oh, another 42.2. Uh, statistic that came out this week. Yes. Is it's it? It's derived. So it's a ratio of something to something. It's a difference between. It's a difference. Is it a is percent it the, difference? Is it the um, jobs uh, plentiful minus jobs hard uh, to get from? No. no. Oh, no. That, that's a really good, good. That um, good. Yeah, that's a good one because that's got to be pretty close to that 42 point. Is it coming from a survey like that? Uh, Michigan? Yes. It's coming from Michigan, University of Michigan? And another one. And another Oh, is one. it the difference between conference board and Michigan? Uh, it, is. it is. Oh, it is. That's masterful, I'll have yes. to say. That Actually. was masterful. <laughs> There's the cowbell. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. You, want explain? you want to explain, Chris? Sure. So it's the difference between the conference board. Consumer Confidence Survey and the University of Michigan Sent Consumer Sentiment Survey. Hmm. Conference board was actually up um, from February to March, from 103.4 to 104.2. <clears throat> the uh, Michigan was down, right? So they moved in different directions. They, uh, they have different focus. So the conference board really focuses more, I would say, on the labor market. So it does suggest that consumers still feel some strength in, that, in the labor market that's creating some of that confidence. University of Michigan tends to focus on stock market, gas prices, more pocketbook issues. So there's some weakness uh, there. The difference is interesting just because historically, uh, when, the, uh, when these two measures have diverged, we have had recessions, right? So it's, it's not at the largest uh, differential, but it's, it's uh, quite elevated. So it does suggest that there might be some of that uh, tension between what Consumers feel in terms of the labor market, which with, which is tends to be lagging, and what they're feeling elsewhere uh, in the economy, which might be more forward looking in terms of their spending. Right. Have we ever had a situation where uh, the, the, we've had this wide gap and it's closed because Michigan has risen and Conference Board has remained stable, or has it always been the opposite? 
Oh, I, I, I should take a look. I don't I'd be know. curious. Yeah, yeah, just really curious. Uh, you know, that, that would either support your view or my view. So, uh, Charmaine's view. So, okay. All right. I got, I got one more statistic and then we're going to move on. I hope this isn't too hard. 3.3%. Uh, that's uh, Moody's Analytics House Price Index year over year growth rate. No. Well, maybe. <laughs> I don't is. know. You said that with <laughs> a lot know. of confidence. Is it really? <laughs> okay, but that's 3. not the is it really February to February? Yeah. Charmaine, did you see how proud he was of coming up yes, with that answer? Yeah. He was so <laughs> proud. And I'm sitting here saying, no, that's not the one. That's not the one I was thinking of. Uh, but that's funny. But that's good. That's really good. Well, and, and obviously, uh, sequentially, it's declining, right? But yes. because it said strong price growth a year ago, it's still up on a year over year basis. But that's going to change pretty soon, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Another month or two. Okay. All right. How much? How about your home in uh, Pennsylvania? How's that doing, Chris? Probably better oh, than just your, fine. probably better than your crypto portfolio. I, I'm just you know, no. I don't know. Crypto portfolio is doing pretty good. It's back up again. Okay. It's it's, right. uh, it's zero and it's still zero. So okay. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. No. No. But in all another in three point three. In all seriousness, <clears throat> I had another three point three percent in mind. And is again, it an my, income measure? It's an income measure. Gosh, Marissa's on fire. My gosh. Yeah. yeah. Disposable okay. income? Disposable income. And what is it? It, you know, just give me a little bit more. And I real, 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 very good. Real disposable year income. Year over year. Year over year. Yeah. Way yeah. To go. That's perfect. That's teamwork. Yeah. 3.3%. <laughs> so this is important uh, going back to recession because. It, you know, real incomes, real after-tax incomes are now rising and uh, after falling pretty significantly in 2021 through the first half of 2022. And that's on top of uh, a lot of still available excess savings that households built up during the pandemic, particularly among high-income and middle-income households. So it feels like to me that consumers have a lot of kind of financial firepower here, at least in aggregate. I mean, I'm glossing over the distribution. Yes, low-income households are under a lot of pressure. And yes, they're borrowing against their cards. And you know, I would expect some weakness there in spending. But for middle-income, high-income households, it feels like they've got a, a, a lot of firepower there. And that's obviously key to any recession. And it's hard to see how an economy goes into recession if consumers are doing their part. So just a, just a reason for a bit of optimism. Um, okay. So let's, uh, so what do you think, Charmaine? What, what do you think of that? I'm that so glad fun. I didn't participate. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have even come close to, on any of them. <laughs> yeah. We, we have a lot of fun with this. Um, so let's turn back to China. Uh, and then we'll, I, I know you're running out of time, so maybe we'll talk for the next 10, 15 minutes about the, your, the, your perspective on China. And here I'll have to say, and maybe I, this is just my take on looking at the work, uh, re relatively quickly. Here you have a glass uh, half empty kind of perspective that your views of China are uh, 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 that it's going to struggle here. Do I have that roughly right? Uh, you have that uh, completely Dead right. right. Completely. Dead right. Yes, that yeah. sounds great. Uh, we actually uh, wrote a report in 2013 uh, about emerging markets in general. And we said emerging markets when the tide goes out referring to the Warren Buffett expression and saying that basically the tide has gone out on emerging markets. They have major structural fault lines and they didn't deal with them when they had their Goldilocks periods after China joined the WTO. So let's say from 03, 04, 05, et cetera, over that window. And then we did a report on China in early 2016, we published it and we said walled in China's great dilemma. And the message there was that China has no great options uh, in terms of do they increase debt to maintain growth? What do they do in the property sector? How can they boost consumption? What do they do with their state-owned enterprises? Do they actually follow through on reforms? And that all of these measures would slow down growth. And would they be willing to make the short-term trade-off for the long-term? So even though people say China is very focused on the long-term, actually it seems that they, over this window, they wanted to avoid the slowdown short-term. And we then decided that we should update that report that was published at the beginning of 2016, because our view was actually that the outlook was worse 
than when we published that report and that people were underestimating the significant headwinds that China faces. And so we wrote this report, Middle Kingdom, Middle Income, that China will not become a high income country and that they face significant headwinds, everything from demographics to too much debt, to stalled reforms, uh, to too much investment in property and infrastructure, which will result in rising debt and defaults, which means then the central government will have to absorb this, to obviously very significant geopolitical headwinds. And people really underestimate the structural issues, labor productivity. As a very good example, people think it's an incredibly productive labor force. It's actually a particularly uh, uneducated labor force in aggregate when you're talking about the numbers. And the fact is that when you look at a ranking of whatever source you want to use, World Bank, governance indicators, OECD data, whatever source you'd like to use, you actually can see it's a particularly not well-educated wor wor workforce that will mean much lower labor productivity. The debt debt is significant. It's not an opinion. It's a sort of a fact. Mm. Uh, and so as we look forward, our view is China's GDP prior to COVID, and we just like to look at the data taking out these few years, average 7.7. Our view is starting with 2023 for the next 10 years, it's going to be about 3.5% ending at 2.5 by the end of 2032. Mm. So that means at half the growth rate. So investors need to think about what that means in terms of growth and earnings per share growth. Uh, exporters, so if you're Australia, if you're Brazil, if you're Saudi Arabia, if you're European luxury goods, all people need to think about a much slower growth economy and what does that mean for their sales and obviously what does that mean for their funding capability from a geopolitical perspective with what they want to do with the military yeah it's a uh, pretty sobering uh and it, uh I, you, you think about all the negatives here and you did a great job in that in that paper uh, out uh, going through them from the demographics the decline in the working age population all the way now down to the, the tensions uh, between China, the U.S., and other Western nations, and kind of the deglobalization, you know, that's going on. I don't, I don't know if you use that word, but I, I'm putting words in your mouth. I mean, we're kind of pulling away from each other, and of course, that hurts everybody. But China is so such an open economy that's got it's going to hurt China a lot more than you know an economy like the U.S. is that's more insular. Now, you you put that paper out. There are you know, folks out there, China bulls that, you know, take a very different perspective. What What's the, like the most uh, significant pushback that you got? Like was someone saying, no, you're wrong. And here's the reason why, what is that reason? Cause it is just, it's so compelling to me, your, you know, your argument, I, I'm having a hard time thinking the other, the counter here. So have you heard a good argument on the other side of this? Well, I could tell you that uh, since you mentioned Larry Summers, he actually gave incredible feedback and thought it was a very thorough, very balanced, very um, well-researched uh, report. And we actually, I don't know if you, if you actually look at the report, you'll see all the different people across different spectrums that we spoke to, including bulls and bears. So we have spent a lot of time with those who are bullish on uh, China to go through their arguments and what has changed and what hasn't changed. So, for example, somebody might say, well, China actually continues to like uh, small businesses. But the facts are, from a private versus public sector, the Chinese Communist Party is getting much more involved in the private sector. And the return on assets, the profitability, the profit margins are substantially greater in the private sector than in state-owned enterprises. So that itself tells you something. The fact that, for example, Chinese growth has outpaced that of the U.S., let's say roughly since the beginning of the MSCI index by, let's say, high single digits, 7%, 8%, yet the earnings per share has been the exact opposite. U.S. with a slower growth has far outpaced in terms of earnings per share growth. Mm -hmm. If you look at the MSCI China index, actually from a price perspective since inception is negative. If you look at the performance of earnings and market pricing since the trough of the global financial crisis, China's returns are a quarter of that of the U.S. So think about assets compounding at 16, 17% 
versus something that's sort of low, mid, single digit. It's just incredible. So when people who are more bullish make statements, for example, they're quite vocal people who say China has a more educated population. That is just factually not correct. Mm. People can talk about, for example, um, how different countries treat people when it comes to governance, when it comes to social issues, when it comes to environmental issues. China just doesn't compare to the U.S. So when people make these statements, mm -hmm. they're assertions. They're not factually based. Mm -hmm. And there's some people who have higher profiles and go out there and make these statements and people hear them. But whenever we show the data, objective facts, not again, not a glass half full, half empty, but the actual facts, people actually tend to agree with our uh, general observations. Yeah, and it has enormous implications. I mean, you, you know, in terms of uh, global growth, but also, as you point out, in terms of commodity prices, right? For everything from oil to coal to you know, metals and minerals, uh, agricultural products. So that has very significant implications around the world if if China is going to experience that much slower growth. Yeah. Yes, and 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 it also has implications if you think of GDP per capita in China versus the U.S. China's GDP per capita is below the poverty level of the United States. People forget that. It's a large mm -hmm. economy, but it's a poor economy. Mm -hmm. And so they need continued growth. And if they're achieving growth at these lower levels, what does that mean in terms of their ability to fund education, to fund social security, to do things that would enable them to actually become a high income country. And it's just, they're in this trap. That's why we said walled in, they have no great options. We said that in 2016, and now they have even less with a much greater focus on military expansion, which again, crowds out other investments. And that's one thing that worries me a bit is, you, you know, China is a very diverse place. The demographics are quite diverse. And uh, you can kind of manage that diversity in, in thought and culture when things are going well, when your economy is growing quickly, when your incomes are rising, when wealth is increasing and people are getting homes and didn't have homes before. But that's a lot more difficult to manage, you know, when your economy is struggling for an extended period of time, especially in a non democratic This is increasingly China feels less democratic, certainly less democratic, uh, it, you know, can debate to what degree, but it is certainly less democratic today than it was, you know, 10 years ago or, or maybe even 20 years ago. It, it's hard for people to find an outlet to express their frustration and to change things. Uh, and that even adds to it. So the concern is, you know, what does it mean for kind of the internal stability of the country, but also what it means in terms of their geopolitical perspective? You know, this goes to the China, Taiwan kind of uh, issue, because as we've seen around the world in the most obvious case study here is Russia and, and uh, Putin, these the, the leadership will use external uh, threats as a way to kind of try to manage, you know, their internal populations and the and the and the stresses in their internal population. Is is that something that you think is a a, a scenario, a reasonable scenario to consider, or uh, is that uh, something that you feel like that might be an issue here as well? Obviously, geopolitics is not our expertise. So we talk to people who are much more knowledgeable than we are. And we actually have a lot of information in the report on the headwind from a geopolitical perspective. And we actually outline all the different national security strategies that different countries have put forth. There's a great exhibit in the report uh, where we take the U.S. and its allies uh, in terms of these issues. So it would be obviously US, it's Canada, it's Australia, it's Japan, it's all of Europe, et cetera. And then we take Russia and China. And we say, look at the aggregate GDP of those countries relative to Russia and China together. And it's about a third. Then you look at GDP per capita, and it's about a quarter. Then you look at top universities, you look at um, Nobel laureates, and it's substantially less. So on the forward, when you're talking about productivity, when you're talking about innovation, et cetera. And so when you look at that combination, you would say, why would actually these two countries choose to divide the world and become uh, so hostile towards the West in some ways? And why is that economically reasonable? And from our perspective, it is not a 
economically rational decision. And we try to emphasize that because at the end of the day, if ideology is dominating the economy, then it's not relevant. There's actually a great exhibit. We we think it really conveys the image so well. The uh, sort of the announcement of the B-21 bomber, you know, they had that incredible launch in December with this very beautiful imagery and this incredible piece of machinery. And then also in December, the uh, wide-bodied airplanes, the C-919 in China was also did its first uh, flight. And what's interesting is the vast majority of the components, the parts of the C-919 come from the U.S. and, and uh, w- Western Europe. And so when people talk about technology and where each country stands, we have that as an image that the vast majority, and together, I think we're talking about over 80%. We're not saying 60, 65, 70. It's well over 80% mm-hmm. comes from the U.S. and Europe. It's fascinating. Yeah, I'm going to, uh, we're coming to the end here, but I'm going to make you play the game. So and this is based on your report, a great table, and you kind of mentioned it already. Here's the number, 407. 407. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's your number. It's your number. It's in one it's of the It's a tables. 95-page report. <laughs> I'm, I, think- I'm, a, I'm a careful consumer. I told you. <laughs> I, uh, yeah. You looked at no, no. You're cheating because you looked at the summary deck I sent you. Oh, you didn't read the whole report. It's true, it's true, it's true. Although uh, it's the number of uh, U.S. Nobel laureates, 407. Yeah, and of course China. Actually, I was a little surprised Europe had more. I can't remember out of how many total Nobel laureates. Uh, it might have been th- close to a thousand. Yeah, yeah, so, that's yeah. about what the number was. Yep. Yeah, about a so thousand. Less than half. Yeah, and of course China had very few. But anyway, the one thing Charmaine though that I you know because I'm I'm right with you when with your your perspective on china i always guard against though and i have a hard time kind of correcting for it and you mentioned the, there are predisposition to be either half full or half empty the other is home bias you know i i, I feel like you know i'm an american and you know i i'm I, I, I have a team and i i'm, I'm always worried that you know i'm uh, in fact here's a here's a interesting observation or at least to me interesting because from my travels around the world, I'm curious what you think. Everyone tends to be more optimistic about their own country than every other country, all else being equal, except there's one one country where that's not true. And that, that's apropos to the kind of the ethnic heritage of, of this uh, panel. And that's Italians. I find the Italians to think that things are worse than they actually are everywhere else. Certainly in America, in the United States, we we overestimate. We're overly optimistic about uh, things. Do, do, does that is that entered into your thinking at all? That that uh, that there might be a home bias in the way we're thinking about the rest of the world, particularly like a China, or, or are you self aware and you try to you try to correct for that? The group is very very international. So if okay. you look at the list okay. of people who actually yeah. are involved in writing the report with me, yeah. our team, we have Brazilian, we have. Chinese, Chinese, meaning People's Republic of China, Chinese, not American Chinese, who are based either in the U.S., in Europe, or actually in Hong Kong. We have Mexicans on the team. We have Indians, people born and raised in those countries. Mm -hmm. So it's actually uh, the team that gets involved in the report has a lot of people from emerging markets. And so when you look at it, I don't think there's any home bias, even though people have asked us, are you U.S. centric just Mm -hmm. because we emphasize U.S. preeminence? But again, look at the market returns, right? Look at the role of the dollar. I mean, just you look at all these factors. It's hard to argue against it, even though there are people who do that. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Uh, well, I want to thank you, Charmaine, for spending uh, the the time with us. I, I know your time is a, a great value and really do appreciate it. And I'm going to keep plugging you. You're, you know, as you're my cousin. I'm going <laughs> to you know, hug you. Uh, hard. We love that. We love that. We love that. Thank you. Yeah. It, it thank really you so was much. great fun. This thank was great so fun. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you. dear listener, uh, we will be back to you next week. Take care now.